Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today's show is all about Muppets, school pictures and the Palestinian flag. Sesame Street turns 50 years old. Steve McQueen turns School Picture Day into art. And this Palestinian photojournalist puts down his camera to focus on metalworks. American educator Marva Collins once said, the essence of teaching is to make learning contagious. One iconic children's program that truly embodies this philosophy is Sesame Street, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Showcase's Sena Arslan has this look back. There is no average day on Sesame Street. <laughs> That's, That's true. Right. That's right. Oh. Over 4,500 episodes and not a single average day. You know, today, today's was really good. It was pretty good. That was a good one. In the last half century, this street has changed how children watch TV. It helped them learn their ABCs and 123s, deal with death and divorce, and even get sarcasm. Everybody, snappy big bird, come uh, see what, what Elmo it? did. Well, what have you done, Elmo? Well, well, Elmo wrote his own song. Really? What's it called? Elmo's song. Oh, clever title. Yeah, I wish I'd thought Jim of Henson's that. adorable puppets and musical performances by sure. one of the most famous falsetto voices of the world are just one of the many reasons that make Sesame Street so special. But what makes the show a trailblazing first is that it's one of the first businesses to adopt the Think Global, Act Local model in the market. Which means it had a global approach with specifically tailored, localized context. So Oscar the Grouch lives on a Sesame Street in America that looks widely different than the street he lives on in Afghanistan. The show started to develop in the late 60s during the brainstorm sessions between a psychologist and a TV producer. And the question was this, how can television function as a school by reaching millions of children, especially those who cannot afford a preschool? Well, Sesame Street uh, really brought a whole new spirit to television. The 70s were going to be something different. And I think that Sesame Street spent several years in development and really knew what it wanted to do. It had a new way of looking at television and combining that with education. And the time was right for it. There were certain questions being asked about television and certainly the producers of Sesame Street came up with a new way to educate children. And it was something that was as revolutionary as anything that happened in 1969. And its tradition and its experimentation continue today. Sally, you've never seen a street like Sesame Street. Everything happens here, you're gonna love it. The first episode of the show was shot in a studio in Manhattan's Upper West Side in 1969. Since then, it reaches more than 100 million people in more than 150 countries and helped them turn the world into a global village. Elmo thinks Whoopi skin is a very pretty brown. Oh, well, thank you, Elmo. <laughs> oh, yes, diversity and, and inclusion have always been important on Sesame Street. Obviously, we created the, the show's original creators, you know, Joan Cooney and Lloyd Morissette and the original producers created a... Uh, uh, a brownstone, a, a place where monsters cohabitated with humans and the spectrum of humans that was represented on the show from day one was diverse and inclusive. And, and that's been a guiding light for the show over the years. Uh, uh, what's the matter, Julia? Mm, noise, noise, noise. Uh, noise. The sirens are bothering you? Uh, noise, noise, noise. Okay. 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 Boing, boing, boing. You know, most recently, uh, two seasons ago, we premiered Julia, who was a young girl who's on the autism spectrum. And that was just one in, uh, you know, a series of so many initiatives that we've done over the years that are really about inclusion and diversity. Over the last decade, the show has introduced new characters to address various issues, like gender equality and drug addiction. Still, Sesame Workshop thinks its most important initiative ever is a $100 million worth project called Ahlan Simpson, 
or Welcome Sesame. It delivers early learning and nurturing care to children and caregivers affected by the Syrian conflict. It feels a little better when we all play Even though some criticized the show for moving to HBO four years ago and giving the first access to the new episodes to the families that can afford the network, one thing's clear. Yeah, baby. What started as a dream of mass education for underprivileged children is now a global humanitarian project. You could say the whole world lives on Sesame Street. Noor Halabi joins me now. She is a lecturer in media and communication at University of Leeds. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today, Noor. So, we just heard first out of New York, but then it took over the Arab world, Sesame Street, for decades. Why was it so popular and so successful? Part of the success of Sesame Street in the Middle East is the fact that it did, um, it did involve itself in localization in a very proactive manner. So, uh, compared to other shows, for example, uh, a lot of Middle Easterners have grown up with Doraemon or other sort of uh, Japanese anime shows that were um, adopted through dubbing. Instead, uh, there was a very proactive uh, process of um, not just dubbing, but thinking of content that is local and always thinking of these local partnerships when uh, developing Sesame Street. So it was it was so popular as I was sort of preparing for the 50th anniversary, I looked up on YouTube and there are sort of people sharing um, the opening song and people tearing up and all these YouTube comments. So there is a very affectionate relationship with Sesame Street in the Middle East. So when you're talking about the uh, successful localization strategy, can you please give us some examples? I mean, are we talking about the um, uniquely Middle, East, Middle Eastern characters, for example? So first of all, they took all the characters and all the characters that we love from the American version turned into Kak, uh, um, Kaki and Gadgur. So basically coming up with localized names, but keeping these characters, which is very interesting because it then combines localization with the fact that you are looking at a very diasporic community that may in fact move into other countries and to, so this ability to still see Kaki and Gerhud in um, Elmo and uh, the Cookie Monster is very instrumental. Um, they even made, so in every iteration that we saw, whether it's the 1979 version um, in Kuwait or uh, later on the 2015 version, we always see, th see this um, very proactive localization to the d extent of clothing uh, or even sort of mannerisms. So I remember the, uh, the one that was produced in the Emirates also included uh, sailors wearing sort of uh, clips on their nose, which was very common at the time for pearl divers. So this is very deep contextual knowledge. Uh, that required dealing with local partners and coming up with extremely sort of localized material mm -hmm. as opposed to simply dubbing or coming up with sort of translations of a script. So, Noor, I mean, just to clarify it for our audience, uh, if Tahia Simsim is the most famous one, and it was airing, uh, that yeah. adaptation of Sesame Street was airing in a few countries, but it's not the only Arabic uh, adaptation of Sesame Street, is it? So the history of uh, Sesame Street in the Middle East is very tied to the history of Arab media in general. It was one of the first shows that was produced. It was also one of the most successful shows that translated throughout the region because they focused on using modern standard Arabic and reaching out to all um, all Arab audiences. It was also successful because, of course, there was very little children's programming at the time. Because Iftahya Simsim ended in 1990, and it wasn't significantly replaced by another show that performed the same function. Reruns of it, similar to how you think of friends around the world, reruns of it continue to run for successive uh, periods of time. And so even though it had stopped, Iftahiya Simsim continued to be the most popular one. Um, then we saw Ahlania Simsim, which was a co-venture between Mubadala um, and, and uh, Sesame Workshop. We are now seeing a new one that is very promising. I'm extremely touched by it as a scholar who looks at media and migration that will look at, it partnered with um, the International Rescue Committee 
and it is uh, actively looking at partners within academia that can tell it what is an important sort of aspect of covering refugees and mm -hmm. children refugees. And it's a performing a really important function there. So it very much responded to the time. In every iteration, you see this uh, show that is looking at what is needed for, um, for this Arab audience, what is needed for a specific Arab audience and how they can perform yes. that. Uh, Dawood Kutab looked at, for example, and I go on, but there's so much to say. It is yeah, just me. I, ha I have to interrupt you there uh, because um, you talked about the new version, which I'm really uh, curious about as well. You said that you're excited about it. Tell us why you're excited. Tell, tell us where you think it's important, considering the fact that I heard that there is a refugee character in it. Can you there please is. enlighten us about that? <laughs> I think um, one of the things that's really interesting in this show is that it diverges from the original format of uh, the show is supposed to supplement the education system. And it starts to think at em about um, emotional intelligence and sort of dealing with emotions. And so, of course, it deals with displacement head on. It doesn't hide from it. It doesn't sort of not deal with it as a shameful thing, but it also uses very positive frames to talk about it. So, for example, um, scholars who look at refugees, they often talk about how refugee children can be damaged by um, or sort of can get damaging messages from a show that talks about them as victims, but they can get very positive me messages from shows that a, depict them teaching other people uh, lessons or also being uh, empathized with, and that is what they're trying to achieve. And I am excited because they reach out to academics and they reach out to experts in uh, child psychology, experts in migration studies, in order to build something, again, that is that is signature of how Sesame Street works. It is not just sort of local, it is really thinking about what the problems are. And they seem to care about this a lot. I mean, thinking that Sesame Workshop is not only doing TV production anymore, but they're actually making visits to refugee camps, for example. Do you feel like that project is working? And it's a good, is it a good idea to take some characters like Tonton, for example, from the Jordanian version of Sesame Street to uh, visit all those um, refugee children in those camps? I think it's extremely important. I think there is a level of normalcy that needs to be created for a refugee population that initiates an ability to build a new sense of home, that builds a, a sense of community and a sense of being able to have a positive life again. And in these instances where you encourage laughter, where you bring in these um, these characters, it becomes really important. Well. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have, but thank you so much for joining us on Showcase. The sounds of excited children are filling the halls of the Tate Britain. It's all part of artist and filmmaker Steve McQueen's Year 3 project, which aims to photograph as many 7 to 8 year olds in what he calls a project of hope. These are among the 76,000 photos of Year 3 pupils from over 1,500 schools in the British capital. Looking and smiling straight at you, these are more than traditional class photographs. They're a glimpse of the next generation who will be running the city. This exhibition really is a portrait of London. It's a portrait of the future as seen through the kind of the present. It's about us at a very particular moment in time. It's an opportunity of bringing together a community of Londoners and really for us to pose and to reflect on the past, the present and also the future. This vast installation is a result of McQueen's inspiration of his own school photo from 1977. McQueen said he wanted to encapsulate this moment in these children's lives. He says year three is a turning point year in these students' lives, a sentiment echoed by the man in charge of the exhibition. When you're about seven, and you'll probably remember this, it's the kind of time in your life when you become aware of belonging to something bigger than your family or your friendship group or your faith perhaps, and you start to become aware of belonging to something much bigger which you would call society. Um, so each of these uh, small, well, each of these individual class photos is like a microcosm of society. A very noisy microcosm, given the sounds of hundreds of children who are filling Tate Britain every day since the exhibit launched. 
And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of art and culture. The Venice Biennial has been forced to temporarily shut down after the city was hit by its worst floods in half a century. The deadly surge of water has already killed two people and the mayor says hundreds of millions of dollars of damage may have occurred. Among the flood damage is St. Mark's Cathedral with its medieval mosaic floors under threat. Venice's mayor says the city is on its knees. Garth Brooks won a record seventh Entertainer of the Year prize at the Country Music Awards, whose acceptance speech was highlighting the female act, while some at the event in Nashville hoped a woman to take home the prize, Marin Morris did win Album of the Year for Girl. A world record for an Ed Ruscha painting was set at Christie's. The post-war and contemporary art evening sale in New York got an offer of $52.4 million. That's 10 million more than what was expected. Hurting the Word Radio No. 2 is one of Russia's early text paintings, which dates back to 1964. Ido Meneo, Mozart's opera about the King of Crete returning home from the Trojan War, is getting an update you might not expect. A group of actual refugees are playing themselves to give the production a modern update with a modern day message. A scene we're used to seeing on the news, not on a theater stage. 30 migrants in Italy are stealing the show at the Rome Opera House as part of a reboot of Mozart's Idomeneo, King of Crete and their past experiences is not so different from the story told in the opera. Just like the victims of the Trojan War, who are held prisoners on the king's ship, they too had to forcibly leave their war-torn countries. It is a story of migrants, of war, of everything that this show tells. I understand it, I feel it. It is a message that speaks to me, and that is why I'm participating in this production. They're extras in the show and either play themselves or the role of soldiers. It's really a great privilege because all my life I've always dreamed to, to be an actress, but since I haven't achieved that one yet, at least this is a stepping stone. Idomeneo also means progress for the opera's producers as they try to transform Mozart's masterpiece into a powerful metaphor for what's happening today with the migratory flows to Europe. This theme of war and conflict is very topical, and you can feel it in the staging of this very modern opera, with these soldiers dressed like real soldiers, but also like migrants and refugees. It is about two kinds of people who unite in the end. It's a call for peace, but also a message of hope for the thousands of refugees struggling within Italy's borders with nowhere to go. Death, sickness, bankruptcy and imprisonment. For years, photojournalist Haitam Al-Khatib has been dogged by the trials and tribulations of living in Palestine. But now the man has put down his camera to seek solace in bending metal wires and turning them into art. Palestinian photojournalist and filmmaker Haitam Al-Khatib wrote on his Facebook page, I fell into deep despair hating myself and the world. It was these years of personal tragedy and helplessness that led me to pick up a camera. Al-Khatib was imprisoned at age 15 after attending an anti-Israeli protest. In his mid-twenties, he lost his father and one of his sons. Bankruptcy and further health problems followed him and his family. Despite the everyday struggles of the people of Palestine, the photographer has found a way to release his frustration and find peace through the camera lens. Photography was a peaceful outlet for him, but now he has moved on to making sculptures out of metal wires. His art portrays the culture of Palestinians and the horrors of war, or sometimes the ordinary life. 
like a girl playing a flute in a field. The world sees our story through videos or photos in the news. But I'm trying to use art to report our story, the story of our resistance. So, for those who don't understand our story from the news, I'm working to make the story simple through my work of art. He makes them with recycled metals. He says, to him, it's not only a way to create art, but also to show who his people truly are, without politics casting its shadows over their lives. Some people working in the movie industry considered subtitled films to be box office poison. But South Korean dark comedy Parasite has managed to break both international box office records and beat out mega-budget Hollywood superhero productions. To understand the secret of its success and what has audiences hooked, showcases Ali Jan Pamir takes a look inside what makes this Parasite so popular. Despite lacking blockbusting ticket sales in the past, foreign film festival circuit veteran John Hu Bong has finally managed to break it big with Parasite, a dark comedy about the dark side of the class system. The movie, which took home the top prize at this year's Com Film Festival, follows the Kim family as they slowly take over the household, where they work as servants. Reviews have called the feature as a well-made Hitchcockian study of intricate human relationships. And this critical acclaim has also been accompanied by financial success. Parasite broke the record for best opening for a foreign film in the U.S. and has currently grossed $98 million worldwide. The makers of the flick say part of the film's success is due to its subject matter, the family. The family is the most basic unit of life. They are very different in terms of living conditions and circumstances. We all have families, but they're all different. I wanted to make the most intimate film, starting from the most basic unit of life. And judging by their attendance, audiences agree. Bong also echoes that idea, noting that the complicated relationship between the different classes of families featured in the film is part of the universal, enduring allure of Parasite. We're touching on courtesy toward human beings, human dignity, whether one becomes parasitic or symbiotic and coexistent in the best sense, I think, might depend on how much courtesy one has toward human beings. execution of the family theme by Bong might have helped in boosting Parasite's ticket sales. But a larger factor that cannot be ignored is that without winning the Palme d'Or at Cannes earlier this year, the movie would likely have not reached the same degree of exposure and therefore popularity on the global market. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we go, artist Anish Kapoor has had a tense relationship with China. His activism and China's plagiarism made exhibitions of his work almost impossible until now. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.